guys, it's the captain here, and today, on a very special episode of The Captain Meets, uh, I am with uh, Richard Shaw, guitar player from one of my favourite bands in the whole world. Almost. <laughs> Everyone's favourite band in the whole world. Everyone's <laughs> favourite satanic death metal band. Uh, I jest slightly, but no, it's lovely to have Richard in. He's a, a currently touring with Cradle of Filth. Mm -hmm. Been in Cradle for four years now. Coming up to five, yeah. Coming up to very, five very years. To five. Uh, but Richard is a um, used to live in Guildford, uh, studied at ACM, uh, and is a very talented guitar player, done lots of different things from literally Aladdin to Cradle of Filth and everything in between. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we thought we'd, he, he was swinging by and we thought we'd have a look at some of your guitars, talk about your life and bits and bobs. So, welcome. Welcome and thanks for popping by. Thanks for having me. This is pretty surreal because I'm a fan of the show as well, so it's pretty weird. And uh, from being at ACM, like popping in the shop just to pick up my pack of strings and get my student loan and go, right now, can I finally afford a Boss TU2 or something like that? And go, right, okay, now, and then I'm, I'm here now, so it's all a bit surreal for me. Well, it's, it's pretty cool, though. It's cool. And I'm, you know, so happy, always, always happy whenever I meet anybody that studied at ACM that goes on to to you know make a, a career for themselves as a, as a musician as that's you know that's obviously the dream of, of everybody that starts at ACM it is yeah. um so tell us a little bit about how you got into the guitar then and you know what life was like you know how old were you when you got your first guitar and you know what were you listening to that inspired you wow um I picked up a guitar at 11 years old mm -hmm. um just from being a huge Queen and Metallica fan and weirdly enough, it was like Queen, Metallica, Prince, Thin Lizzy. It was kind of everything was yeah. going on in kind of a rock and pop kind of world in my parents' house. And, and we'd go visit my grandparents and they'd have like Elvis and Cliff Richard and Chuck Berry and all kinds of like the old rockabilly stuff on as well. And I was always kind of drawn to the guitar side of things. Even as a kid, apparently, I was like pointing out to like the guitar solo going, what's that, what's that? Not knowing what it was. Yeah. But, so there, I don't know, there's kind of feel this gravitational pull towards guitar music, even from a young age. So when I was 11, I finally got my first guitar, just a regular kind of three quarter size nylon string acoustic like everyone does, and parents mm -hmm. are like, right, until we can see some progress, we're not gonna buy an electric, but it's like, but mom, dad, I wanna be Brian May. Brian yeah. May doesn't have a Enter nylon Sandman string. Enter Sandman doesn't sound good on a nylon string yeah. three quarter size guitar, but, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a year later, I, I, I did get an electric guitar, and, and that was it. Just I just practiced all the time, and. There was no big goal other than I just want to play guitar, and mm -hmm. that was all it was. I just idolised, like, say, Brian May and Prince and guys from Metallica. And my tastes kind of diversified from there, like, around the kind of late 90s kind of scene when I was, like, 13, 14. There's, like, all these kind of bands like Disturbed and Slipknot, mm -hmm. and later on, like, Alter Bridge, Coed and Cambria, all these kind of, like, more hard rock mm -hmm. slash metal bands. Uh, and then as soon as I was 18 and went to ACM, that was it. My taste just diversified somewhat and you're hanging around with people who are into every style of music yeah. and they'll show you the cream of a crop in every style of music. I was like, yeah. I'm, not the, I'm not the biggest R&B fan, but then all of a sudden you get, you got a guy who's like, you listen to the wrong stuff, that's why. And you're like, oh my God, R&B's amazing. I mean, it was, that was pretty much how it happened for everyone. So I was introduced to like, Every, my mate was like, well, you're a Prince fan, here's some Slime the Family Stone, here's yeah. some Tower of Power, and it just became this big yeah. melting pot. And I don't know, I, I just, the re, to be honest with you, the reason I went to ACM was because I'm just a huge Steve Vai fan as well. And I was like, well, he went to Berkeley, so if I want to be Steve Vai, I've got to go to a music school. And like ACM at the time was like, the best yeah. one in the UK, if not Europe. Uh, and that was it. I got, was lucky enough to get in and just kind of guitar's been my who, life who ever since. Who were your since. main teachers then? I'm just trying to, what, what year are we talking? Uh, I was there between 2003 and 2006. Right. So we're talking like Jamie Humphreys, who is the, the reason why I'm such a big hybrid picker. Yeah. Like I'd never seen anyone yeah. use a, a, a pick and fingers at the same time yeah. before until I saw Jamie do it in front of me on my first lesson with him. I was yeah. like, what, great are you, player. what are you doing? Yeah, great <laughs> like, that's just Especially so with the Queen stuff as well. Exactly, great exactly. Yeah. Like it, it was pretty cool Like because he knew I wanted to do the whole kind of West End thing as yeah. well with doing musical theatre is one of the many things I do. He knew I wanted to do that as well. Yeah. Basically, I went to ACM going, well, I'm never going to be in a heavy metal band. 
ironically. <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna, this heavy metal thing isn't working out for me. Um, even at ACM, they were like, it's great practicing all the sweet picking and crazy alternate picking stuff, but don't rely on like the metal thing yeah. being a source of income, over the irony. Yes. But, uh, so I kind of gave up on the whole metal thing. I was just like working on all the other chops and my reading, my ear, my rhythm chops. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, yes, yeah, so, so it was kind of weird. Like I finished ACM, went back home and was like became a guitar teacher, started playing guitar for musical theatre, mm -hmm. uh, like local productions. Again, something I still do between cradle tours. And then it just... Uh, I love came that. from there. It's just yeah, just from the context. Just, kind of just think there. this January when you're going down to your local theatre and watching some sort of Puss in Boots or whatever the pantomime is that they've. There's a chance that you know a guitar player from a band like Cradle of Filth could well be sitting in the pit. Yeah, doing, you know, and I think it's. I just think it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, and all power to you for just kind of going. Yeah, if, if that's it's a paid gig, and and I, and I like playing guitar, and that was what it was. Happy days, it it just became one of those things where I just went home, going right. I got this degree now. I don't want to be one of those guys who goes back home and does nothing with what yeah. I've learned. I've, I've just had the best three years of my life. Yeah living, breathing, sleeping, guitar and music. Yeah. All I don't want to go, do is go home and, you know. Work in a music shop. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that. Weirdly enough, I worked in a music shop for a very short amount of time. Like, like, like this Christmas tent work before I became a guitar teacher. And um, I just wanted to do something with it. And then yeah. I was just happy to be making a living from teaching. As far as I was concerned, I'd made yeah. it. Because I was playing guitar yeah. for a living. Yeah. Yes, I was teaching in primary schools, secondary schools, privately. Um, nothing too crazy. It's not like I was teaching dream theatre on a daily basis, but you, yeah. you, and, and kind of practicing at the end of a working yeah. day, working on my own stuff. And as far as I was concerned, I'd made it. I'm yeah. paying my bills, I'm paying my mortgage by playing guitar. And then the cradle of call came. But you're, just before that, though, because your own stuff, you you you. You obviously have got an affinity with a sort of a higher gain kind of metal genre because your own stuff, the, the, when I was, you know, doing a bit of research and yes, everybody, I listened to a lot of Cradle of Filth, uh, but I also listened to, Favorite band. um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I also listened to, uh, one of your original projects, uh, NG 26. Yeah. And I mean, I, obviously I'd never heard of them and I, and I guess that didn't, wasn't necessarily a huge thing. But I really liked the, uh, you know, I, it's got those very big chop led driving guitar sort of high gain rock stuff. So is that, you know, I mean, do you still, you know, is that still fundamentally where you feel your heart kind of lives with regards to guitar music? Yeah, like I say, I think I was just lucky that I grew up in a house where it was all kinds of music, but something like gravitated I, well, I gravitated towards like the um, kind of late 90s, early 2000s kind of thing where it was like bands like Creed, later mm. to be Alter Bridge mm. and uh, Disturbed, um, Code and Camry, these kind of bands yeah. that, that kind of like went into my own music. I was yeah. kind of naturally going towards Alter Bridge style yeah. chords when I was just writing my own stuff yeah. and different tunings and all this kind of stuff. And that, that's kind of way my ear and my writing kind of lean towards. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the, the metal chops were still there, but not in a Cradle of Filth kind of metal yeah. sense. It, yeah. it was all about uh, the big melodic choruses, um, being the only guitar player in the band. I was yeah. a big fan of doing the drop D thing, not just for the heaviness, but because I've got the other three fingers free to play melodies at the same time. Yeah. Uh, can still solo. It was like ev everything with NG26 and my other band, Emperor Chung, who were a bit more progressive. Mm -hmm. um, I was still getting everything out songwriting wise that I wanted mm -hmm. f as a guitar player and as a writer. And and so that's why it was such a weird shift when I went on to play guitar for Cradle of Filth, a very different style of writing. So, so how does that playing? You know, what, typically what kind of gigs were you doing with Emperor Chung or, or NG26? Like in terms of, you know, we play in front of dozens of people or hundreds of people or thousands of people I mean what it, was the it was a little bit of everything right. we were quite lucky like especially with Emperor Chung we did manage to play Download 2013 where we mm -hmm. opened the third stage mm -hmm. and as far as I was concerned that was the You've biggest thing it. I would yeah. ever do I was yeah. like I'm going to milk this because yeah. this is the, the biggest moment I'm playing Donington which I live just down the road from Donington yeah. and all that kind of stuff is obviously the spiritual home of rock and metal and yeah. all that and so we pl played Download but we, then we broke up 
soon after that, it was kind of a download curse where it's like, well, how do we follow it? And we went, went back to playing like pubs and clubs and yeah. it, it became very difficult to, to make that shift. Yeah. Um, NG26, it was a similar kind of thing. We didn't play download, but a lot of similar kind of size venues. Uh, and, and we were signed and it just became mm. a big slog. And then I was with both those bands when the Cradle Call right. came. And they, what, well, they spotted you, did they? Or, you, um, or auditioned or what was the... From what I gather, uh, Paul, the previous guitar player, c couldn't do a tour. Yeah. Like, just to finish off a tour so there's a, a month-long tour of Europe booked. Uh, I got a call in late December, and this was early February, was going to mm -hmm. be a tour. Just from a friend of mine who happened to be their sound guy, I was going, right. look, there's a, there's a band that I work with, and he works with so many bands. Yeah. Um, he just said, are you free for a month-long tour of Europe? Didn't tell me what band it was or anything. And I was like, well, that sounds amazing. He says, if anything, it's just a great thing put, to put on the CV, but don't move some things aside. If you've got some like musicals booked or anything, don't cancel it because it's not really that big a deal kind right. of thing as far as he was concerned. <laughs> right. He'd been doing it for years. He was yeah. like, yeah, it's a job. It's what it is. Um, and then he says, oh, the manager will give you a call in the morning. I was like, okay. And then they're like, hi, this is Faye, Cradle of Filth's manager. I was like, sorry? <laughs> Who's manager now? <laughs> Obviously knowing the name, and yeah, my yeah. brother being a For die sure. hard fan. And they'll be like, right, we'll get the, uh, Martin, the drummer, to get in touch with you. Um, and he'll talk about like a video audition. And it was like, well, learn these two songs that they had planned in the set, which were like the two hardest songs. They're like, can you get the audition tape by tonight? <laughs> Bear in mind, I was teaching like nine yeah. in the morning to like nine in the evening. And then they're like, if you could get it to us by midnight tonight, that would be great. Me being like, this is probably my only chance yep. of getting something this big. I was like, well, I've got like three hours to learn these two songs and send off a video audition. And it turns out there were a few other guys in the running, like yeah. apparently, as far as I'm told, like bigger named artists from cool. around the world. I was the only one who handed in the audition tape on time. And you literally in three hours, and presumably two and a half of those hours was just putting the makeup on, wasn't it? And then like... <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I didn't realise it'd be like, like a makeup test as well, like for a screening of a film or something. Let's do a makeup test for him. Let's see if he looks good. No, it was just a pure, just film yourself playing That's, the songs, that's and great. there was probably loads of mistakes. I probably didn't figure it out correctly. You're there on mid internet tab sites going, let's see, and obviously they're all in the wrong tunings. They're yeah. not right because. Uh, some Cradle of Filth stuff is, is pretty technical. Yeah. It's not the most technical stuff in the world, but at the same time, it's quite tricky to figure out, especially the, the older stuff. Yeah. When it's buried under layers of keyboards yeah. and so much stuff going on, you're trying to pick out the guitar parts. Like, yeah. I'm going to guess it's something like this and send it off. And I was like, oh, I've probably really failed this yeah. audition, but at least I've done it. I'm like, let's just wait and see. And as is the way in the music industry, you don't hear anything. You're yeah. like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then three days later, it was Danny, our singer, sent me an email going, Cool, so do you want to do the tour? That's brilliant. What? And I had like four or five weeks figured, here you go, here's like a two hour long set. Playing like my fourth ever show was like at the forum, a sold out forum at Kentish Town. Fantastic. And stuff like that, just being thrown into it. How many rehearsals did you get before uh, you were doing the first gig? Technically two days, but they were like right. two half days. Because obviously it's very full on, our drummer's like, I'm not going to do the set more than like twice through. Yeah. And that was the first day I met them. So I only met them two days wow. before the first show. And then that was when we got to Munich, did the sound check. It was like, yeah, I think I know what I'm playing now. I think I know. <laughs> like constantly doubting myself, yeah. even practicing on the way there. My first time in a tour bus, kind of getting to know everybody, but at the same time secretly in the back room going over things, going, I hope I know what What's I'm, the... when I'm playing here. <laughs> I mean, I know this is a bit niche and, and not going to apply to everybody watching this, but have you got any advice for when that, you know, if that if you're lucky enough that that call comes in, you know, it's like fair enough. You're stepping into somebody's shoes or whatever. You you've just got this like here's your one opportunity. And 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 I suppose you know the audition was its thing, and and you had to be on point to to, to do that. Um, but the tour itself was probably almost like an extended um, like audition for the like you know is this it, guy it what, what? So have you got any tips that you would say to to, to anybody? Yeah, if your break comes along, what what do you... Uh, just, weirdly enough, it's the same advice that I got when I was at ACM. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every tour I ever had was just like, say yes now, worry later. Right. Like, even when I like, was in a... I joined a covers band, they were like, we'll pay you X amount of money for a one-off gig, learn these 20 songs. Oh, by the way, we're doing Hotel California. Do you own a double-neck yeah. SG? Yes. <laughs> 
put the phone down. Great, I've got the, the gig. I've got some money in the bank as long as right. I can learn these songs in time. Which, weirdly enough, is the way my life's been ever since that moment. Because there's always one project or another I've got to learn a million songs for. With very short notice. Put the phone down and like phoned all my mates. Says, has anyone got a double neck SG? <laughs> I mean, yeah. tomorrow. So say yes, worry later. And one of my uh, old friends did tell me like, and it's it's so teacher speak mm. when I come out with stuff like this. But it, it's true. It's like success is when opportunity meets talent. Like if the opt if that is yes sounds pretty deep. That's about as deep as it's going to get. By the way, so apologies for that. It's fine. <laughs> um, but it's true. It's like when the opportunity comes a- along, if you haven't put the hard work in beforehand, mm-hmm. that opportunity is lost and it's long- lost forever. Yeah, you don't get that second call if you're not ready for it. It's as simple as that. Um, but at the same time, you, I know some players back home are incredible players, and they just never get the call. Yeah. Like I know I'm not the best guitar player on the planet. I'll, yeah. I, I, I'm the jack of all trades, master of none kind of player. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be the first to admit that. And obviously I'm always trying to get better and try and improve and be a better writer and all that. But there's some people back home who are way better than I'll ever mm-hmm. be and they just never get the call. And it's, I was just one of the lucky ones. And I know it's not mm-hmm. lost on me how lucky I am to be in this position. <laughs> was there any other, you know, were there any like technical challenges? I mean, presumably you'd never tour well maybe you have but you know was that was like the rig you were touring with completely different for for the first cradle lap cradle tour that you did than anything you'd done with your own bands before it, it was it wasn't so far removed that i wasn't f- right. familiar with the rig or anything like that that first tour i ever did they just had we said don't worry about gear we've got some stuff in storage you're going to use that and it was my first time having a guitar tech mm-hmm. so i was like now i've officially yes. made it i have a guitar tech Restring I, this. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but Not it was, that you talk like that. You don't talk like that to guitar techs. But it, it, it was the, the guitar techs. They're the people who can. Guitar techs and sound engineers are the people who make you sound great at the end yeah. of the day. And like I was using a Mesa Boogie dual rectifier at the time through a Rooster 2B12 cab. I'd never even heard of Rooster. Mm-hmm. Most people haven't, but that yeah. cab was still one of the best sounding cabs I've ever played through. And they kind of, I kind of left it to them and they dialed it in. I was like, yeah, this sounds phenomenal. In Cradle, we only have to worry about one tone anyway. Yeah. For the solos, front of house, we'll like probably put a bit of delay on and just boost us a little bit. They know when the solos are right. happening, so I don't have to worry about patch changes or anything. Whereas my other bands and doing the musical theatre stuff, I'm, we, especially musical theatre, I'm sight reading and kind yeah, of tap, yeah, dan- sure. tap dancing um, some pedals as well. So it was quite nice not to worry about all that stuff. Was it a... Was it an in-ear thing, like a new in-ear experience, or was Cradle all just Weird regular? Enough, but at back? the time, we were all still on wedges, and ironically, it's the quietest on-stage sound I'd ever had. Yeah. Like, I didn't even need earplugs for that tour. It was really crazy. Yeah. Like, that was the first time I'd been on stage in a high-gain kind of setting where I didn't need earplugs. Everything was super controlled. Amps are off stage. It's right. all that kind of stuff. And it's only been in the last year, year and a half, we've all gone on to in ears yeah. like our singers have uh, Danny and Lindsay they were always on in ears but everybody is now on in ears it's very controlled yeah. everything's DI'd um, so now it's gone the other way where I, we, we went through using the Kempers uh, and now I'm using the Moor Priam this is unbelievable unbelievable we'll talk about gear in a bit but yes if ever you if, if ever you want the uh, the craziest thing I've ever heard about the cheapest live rig for a massive band like this anyway we'll get back to that Mm -hmm. what was the um uh what's a like a a typical cradle show like i mean i'm guessing it's 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 theater isn't it it's like it's um it's uh it's almost operatic style theater for sort of crazy metal so i mean are you standing presumably this like your first gig or the first two or three gigs are you standing there just going what the fuck is going on? Or, Pretty much, or are you yeah. just I still think like that. You do to be honest with you. It's it's again it's not lost on me how lucky I'm to do it, especially compared to my other projects when I'm off tour. Yeah. Like I'm on tour one minute then playing guitar for Jesus Christ Superstar the next. Yeah. So Oh know. my god. <laughs> so, and the irony happened. is not lost on me there yeah. of just like the two religious extremes of the two shows. Exactly. There. Exactly. That's exactly. Amazing. But weirdly <laughs> enough, both have such amazing guitar parts. <laughs> so it's 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 all just part and parcel of being a musician in this oh, day and age. Fantastic. I'm just making myself as adaptable as possible. But those first cradle shows were very crazy. The first time even wearing corpse paint. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff. I'd never been into bands who do that whole thing. 
Yeah. Shock I horror. I'm not a bl- bigger black metal fan or anything like that. <laughs> but I've kind of learned to love it through being in the band. Kind of it. again. Yeah. Going back to when I was at ACM, people exposing me to different genres. The best bands in the genre I've ever like. I, I found out I was listening to like not the best bands in certain right. metal subgenres. But like, no, 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 check this band. Check this band. So again, you have an appreciation for stuff like that. But I never really listened to it before. Never done a makeup thing or being dressed in the, all, all the leather and performing in that way. And um, I don't know, it was almost like all the years of being in all the bands. And are, the, are the fans properly mental at those kind of gigs? Oh, yeah. Them? Yeah, like oh, full yeah. on, all in the garb and everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So even looking out into the crowd is pretty cool. It must that, be insane. Um, it, it, it is brilliant because like the first show was like, what, 2,000 people in Munich. So it was like being shoved into that environment. And every show on that tour was like one and a half, two thousand 2,000 people. Amazing. And they're all screaming and yeah. going mad. Obviously, nobody knew who I was. There's a lot of Cradle of Phil fans who still don't know who I am. <laughs> you know, it's because it's just part and parcel of it. They've had that many members. A lot yeah. of people can't keep up. And again, <laughs> I, I, I find just, it funny. I just couldn't, you know, I mean, fair play, you know, they're, they're from the, the, the least likely part of the UK to form this kind of band. Oh, yeah. You know, out the sort of heart of East Anglia sort of thing. Yeah. And then... There's probably something about Ipswich that creates so? this kind of music. <laughs> I mean, nothing against Ipswich, but I've... Till the we rehearsed in Ipswich. And in this, there's not a great deal there <laughs> other than to make music, I suppose. It's like when you hear stories of, like, the reason why Judas Priest and Black Sabbath sound the way they do is because they grew up in, in Birmingham, yeah. post-war Birmingham. There's no, no wonder they sound the way they do. <laughs> it, I, not, Noddy Holder reckoned it was all the soot in the air that used to make all the voices so gravelly, and that was why they had that kind of uh, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's completely insane. I, I have to say that, you know, my favourite track that came on, you know, as I was listening over the last few days of, of, of the Cradle stuff, a track came on and I'm sort of going, I recognise this track from somewhere like that. And over the first 20 or 30 seconds, it dawned on me that it was an epic cover of Temptation by Heaven 17. Yeah. And I was just thinking, <laughs> um, you know, again, pick a song that you would never, ever dream of a band like Cradle of Filth covering. And that's basically it. And it's wicked. It's that's just like, thing. it's all good. I'll, I'll be honest, like, I, I wasn't in the band at that point, but... That's kind of how I thought it was Cr- Cradle of Filth. Yes, I was a kind of a casual fan because my yeah. brother was like, a yeah. diehard fan. And then they kept bringing out these covers like mm. The Devil Woman by Cliff Richard. And Have they? Was, I oh, didn't yeah. hear that one. Uh, oh, that's I've not amazing. heard it in years. And it's all that kind of stuff. But I'll be honest with you, it, kind of, it was kind of lost on me. Um, but then joining the band, there's a, there is a YouTube appreciation channel. for it. There's definitely a YouTube channel there of black metal Cliff Richard covers. I think. Oh, that, entire that, albums. There uh, needs to be oh, some kind thing. of tribute Mistletone, album. Mistletone and Wine in. Drop C, yeah. <laughs> sort of. It'd be, it, it's just huge. In fact, Leo, if you're watching this, uh, that's what I want your Christmas album to be, please. A whole cover, a whole album of uh, Cliff Richard Christmas songs. It'd be amazing. I'll buy two copies. It's pretty weird because, weirdly enough, when I was at ACM, like living in student digs and all that, for some reason, every Christmas, one of us would always get a Cliff Richard calendar. <laughs> So that just, it's just, again, how the worlds kind of meet up into this uh, moment. That was, thinking, and you, every month you'd be there going, I wonder what he's going to be wearing this Oh, way. please. Like the one where he's just in his underpants and stuff oh, like that. You're no. like, that's just magic. Pure that magic. Was, well that was always Cliff. the every year Secret Santa, someone at work would get the Cliff Richard calendar. But, there's so just there'd always be a one in a telly sales It's office. amazing <laughs> how many metal musicians I know have had the Cliff Richard <laughs> calendar at some point in their life. It's just this oh, kind of weird, fantastic. crazy in joke. It, maybe, yeah. maybe Cradle tapped into that while doing Devil Woman. I don't know. I think it's amazing. It um, well, look, I mean, it's musically a, 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 a real interesting force, the sort of Cradle stuff. I mean, it, again, I've not, I've, I've never been a big fan of, of necessarily the the sort of more sort of screamy approach to, to, to the vocals and stuff like that. But I was listening to a lot of it going, there's a real almost classical crescendo in a lot of the songs you know it starts and builds and it's and it's very cleverly put together you know it's not it's complex sort of deep music you know with obviously unbelievably brilliant lyrics that are you know you can imagine every parent listening and dreading their children listening to this sort of (laughs) stuff but you know it's it's pretty cool um but let's get round to your gear because mm-hmm. that kind of brings us up to you've, you've done the cradle gig now for four years mm-hmm. 
Um, did you say as well before we started that you're now starting to do some writing with the guys and, and yeah we, I mean I've done uh, two albums with the, with oh, the band fantastic. now so there was in 2015 there was Hammer of Witches mm -hmm. uh, and then in 2017 we did a Cryptoriana The Seductiveness of Decay of course it's every metal mm. Yeah, album's got to have always a colon at, in there. Always look at decay. And it's think, like, oh, it's so seductive. when I do a, a prog album, there needs to be a part one somewhere, at least a trilogy. Otherwise, is it really a prog album? You know, not, it's, it's that kind not. of thing. Definitely so um, yeah, so I've written two albums with the guys now, and we're going to start working on my, the third album that I've done with the band very oh, very soon. So we just finished the world tour. Still tying up some loose ends, doing some odd fest winter festivals here and there. Yeah. We've got plans for all kinds of stuff that are going to be announced soon for next year. But in between all these things, we are writing. So it's one thing or another. And in, but obviously, I'm much more interested in this. And the pantomime gig for this Christmas is. It, it's not. I can't do panto because of the cradle commitments. Last year, I did Beauty and the Beast at Derby Arena, which was great just to say I did Derby I Arena. Just, I thought you were going to get me some free tickets for my know, girls uh, and I come uh, along uh, and. I'm, I'm sorry. Gutted. I'm sorry. I can see what I can do. Can I mean, you? The, the cradle gig has opened up a lot of contacts <laughs> for me in the panto world. If you can so, get Dick Whittington at the Woking Theatre, that would be awesome for me. Thanks. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> It's weird how everybody kind of knows each other in the industry, though. I'd meet people like backstage at these big metal festivals. It's like, didn't I work with you on like, like Made in Dagenham <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> this is great. It's, it's stuff like that. All these backstage crew guys, they all just do the same thing, the same circuits. Well, crazy. let's talk about gear, as mm -hmm. the, apparently this is a gear channel. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, Obviously, you wouldn't know it, but apparently you like Paul Reed Smith guitars. I um, like Paul Reed Smith guitars. How many do lot. you own now? I own 14. 14. So, uh, yeah, I own. That's an obsession. It is an obsession, but I've been very, very lucky in the sense that I've only paid full price, I think, for two of them. And one of them was my first ever SE. Remember the old. I think it was in 2001, the Santana SE, when it first oh, came out. Oh, yeah, like the that, original the SE. The original SE, and I still use that every day when I'm teaching, Brilliant. so that's my teaching electric guitar. Um, and that was kind of a guitar that I thought, I'm never gonna own a PRS. I got yeah. it when I was like 15 or 16 going, this is the only way I'm ever gonna afford a PRS. Yeah. Is, Thank you, Paul, for releasing the SE line. Yeah. And then a friend of mine bought a proper custom 24. Mm -hmm. It was the same age as me. I was like, how did you afford that? And he told me about this brilliant thing called finance. Finance! Woo! Finance. And that was it. I was like, Student Ooh, loans and finance. That's for Buy today. Exactly. And it just became one of those things where I was like, I can finally have a custom 24. <laughs> but like I say, I, I, I saved a bit of money for a Les Paul. And I would still love a Les Paul to this very day, but I just didn't get on with them for That's whatever right. reason. They're incredible guitars. I should probably clarify how irresponsible it just was of me to cheer finance there. I've got a funny feeling that some legislation came in earlier on this year that means I shouldn't have done that. So apologies, be responsible when borrowing money. Don't do drugs, kids. Anyway, back to the video. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a great thing, finally got my first Custom 24, and that's where I almost kind of formed my style on, where I was going really serious into the guitar playing mm. thing, where I'd already made up my mind, yes, I am going to go to music school and do this properly. That's where I've kind of formed my style. So I kind of pick up any PRS now, and it just feels like home. It feels comfortable. Mm. But like I say, I love all kinds of different guitars. I've got a, a Gretsch, I've got a Strat, I've just bought a Hagstrom. Oh, um, cool. So I'll use any guitar that's good for what I need it to do. <laughs> I mean, this is the most battle-scarred guitar of your collection. Oh yeah, this is the Cradle of Filth number one. Um, 
this is come fresh from playing Winter Invasion Festival in Germany, so it's still got the same strings on it. Not even cleaned it that well. But Good. it's, um, you know, it's... It's, it's you the dirt you, that gives it the tone. It, exactly. You, you, <laughs> like, and I've, I've uh, say, shaved the neck on it, but I've got to keep the uh, serial number on there. Yeah, so got to do that. Okay, so this is a, this is a single cut. 250. I think the current single cut is a 245, isn't it? So it's a, this is this is a, a, a sort of a more oh, an in between scale length, so a little bit shorter than the strap, but a bit longer than the Les Paul. Yeah. Um, so this is the um, the S2 line. This was like the first S2 they came out with, and I happened to be in Canada at the time, doing my first ever festival mm -hmm. with Cradle of Phil. First time I'm ever playing in front of like 20, 25,000 people. So obviously I'm bricking it, thinking, yeah. all right, I've got to mentally prepare for playing in, this front, in front of this many people. I've never done that before. Um, and then all of a sudden, my main Cradle Filth guitar doesn't turn up. It's Great. still at Heathrow. They said, we can get it to you, but it won't be there until the next flight, which is like 24 hours later. Mm -hmm. I was like, 24 hours later, I'm on stage. There's, there's nothing we could do about it. Luckily, there was a local guitar shop in Montreal um, who got it, this in that day. Yeah. And I was like, well, let's try it out. And I was like, brilliant, that'll do. We, we're on stage yeah. in like four hours. Yeah. It, uh, and we just restring the guitar, he my heavier gauge, because yeah. uh, we tuned to D standard. And it was like, right, do the show. And that was it. That was all it was going to be, give the guitar back the next day. And they were like, ooh, when we gave it back, they were like, ooh, there's a, there's a slight ding on the back from a costume. Yeah. And I was very lucky in the sense of my accountant was like, Rich, you need to buy more guitars. Aha! So she gave me a call a couple of days before. Good tax going, advice. You, you, yeah, she, she says you need to buy at least another guitar. I was like, okay, best accountant ever. Thank you very much. And um, weirdly enough, it came with we were like, we can't, we've got to charge you for that little ding. Mm -hmm. I was like, don't worry about it. I'm buying it anyway. And, and I'd already been endorsed with PRS at this point, but it worked out cheaper than my endorsement. And weirdly enough, it just became the main yeah. Cradle of Filth guitar. So, yes, it's been dinged, it's been all over the world multiple times, and you don't really see relict PRSs because obviously we built so well. And But I, I like that. Mm. I pretty much know where every little ding and scar has come from on the road. Well, so. I know this will be music to Paul's ears because one of the things I think he strives to do with all his guitars is, is make a guitar that's kind of tour ready. Yeah. You know, and the idea of buying one four hours before the gig is like... It, it, it was know, perfect, ready to yeah, go, that, sounded great, that felt great, cool. just straight off a rack, and that was it. So When, when did you yeah. do the neck, though? Because that, that's always been one of the things I, I kind of... I, I never decide whether I ever really like the... the, the uh, finish on the back of a PRS neck you know this they've all they, they mostly lacquer the necks yeah so you 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 sanded this off or yeah uh, there's a guitar tech friend of mine back home and I was just curious and again I've got a couple of mates back home who also use PRS and mm -hmm. they were shaving the necks down and I was like I don't know because you can't go back yeah, you can't, well I don't know well, you, I suppose you can but I was like oh, let, let's try it let's try it on this guitar yeah, because I can't bring myself to do it on this one. This is the backup, but this right. is I, I really like this guitar. Right, again, second hand off a friend of mine back home, so I'm not quite ready to shave the neck off the back of that yet. Um, and it just did the world of good for, yeah. for when I'm touring under the lights. Everything's yeah. hot. Uh, sometimes just the gloss would just stick a little yeah. bit, and um, you know, in a perfect world, if I had a signature, wicked. that's what would happen. So cool. We'll oh wait, are you listening? Yeah. You're listening, Paul. Um, <laughs> I love the way that the bridge is kind of tarnished as well. It, it yeah, look, it looks like. I mean, I bet you couldn't. You couldn't probably do that without hundreds of hours of playing. But it looks wicked. And you've changed the pickups as well, right? I've changed the pickups. Yeah, because they're the regular PRS number sevens, which mm -hmm. are the same one that are in, in this. This is mm -hmm. like the, the pre-lawsuit single cut that PRS sevens were in. Mm -hmm. They were in this as well, just as stock. Uh, but then it became a thing where I was like, well, I'm competing with a guy who's got active pickups in the band, Ash Ocaro, the guitarist. Mm -hmm. he's, he's very much the uh, the whammy bar active pickup member of the band, yeah. and he does that brilliantly, and I don't get in the way of that stuff, hence mm -hmm. why I know whammy bar, we've got very different styles. But it got to a point where I was like, I need some more high gain pickups. I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not the biggest fan of active pickups. Mm -hmm. It's not that I hate them, it's just that I've not found the right one yeah. if there are any active pickups out there that people recommend i'm all up for it but i just like the, the subtleties and the nuances you get from passive pickups mm -hmm. i'm very much kind of an old school player in that sense i just like dynamics yeah and i don't feel like i found an active pickup that has that yet so on the last cradle of filth album cryptoriana i recorded that album with the mark holcomb pyrrhus yeah, se yeah. Mm -hmm. fantastic guitar and weirdly enough mark's 
kind of become a friend because it turns out he's a Cradle of Phil fan as well. Um, so, so it's pretty weird. We talk all the time and I just said, any chance I can get a set of the pickups? And he got in touch with Seymour Duncan and they sent me some pickups, which was amazing. Yeah. Again, I'm still not used to getting things for free. It never really happens. I'm not that high profile player yet. So I was very, very thankful. Stuck them in here. And weirdly enough, because his is a, a double cut, mine's a single cut, it's amazing how much of a difference these oh, sound really? compared to, to his signature. It's not in a good is way that, or a bad is, way. Is that because just, it, this is closer to the bridge or I something? I think so. Maybe it's something or? to do with it being 22 frets, yeah. it's 24. There's something about, especially with this pickup, just sounds it, massively different, the placement of the it was. Itself. It took me a long time to even realise the point on the PRS range, the point between the custom 22 and the 24. And it is really just down to the position of the bridge pickup. Mm. Uh, sorry, the neck pickup. And it's just... On the 22 fret ones, it's further away from the bridge, and it does make a big difference. They're much fatter it really sounding, does. I think, than yeah. the, the 22 fret That's models. why I do love 24 fret guitars. Like I've got my mm. custom 24 here, and uh, there's some stuff where I, I will use a 24, mm. but it, there's something sonically about 22. Mm. I just lend yeah. something like Guthrie Govan and said, what, it's what a grown-ups guitar. You know? I'm guessing it's a wireless <laughs> system, right? But I'm loving how you yeah, connected this, the wireless This is it. the wireless, like we're, we're plugged into the amp here, but then here's my wireless, that just stays gaffered on. Way up, Tiger. Stays kind of gaffered on. But uh, my old guitar tape, I just hardwired this in because I made a habit of like getting into the crowd. Well, we're not getting into the crowd, but getting on the front row. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> pretty much every gig guitar tape was like, I've got a fix your wireless system because they're like they get very grabby get very excited <laughs> they'll be pulling strings and all kinds of stuff and they'll just kept snapping this and when i'd have to go to the backup purely because they'd yeah. snap that and it was just like how about we hardwire it I love so it. it doesn't matter how much they, they grab so it it must be a special transmitter isn't it because I, I don't know how you would plug your kids oh i see yeah so it's plugged in down there right i see so there's another way of, as oh, i say i, see. Yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. get yeah. down the front anymore so i might go back to having the traditional kind of jack input G give us a big fat like chord on that of just like a right so yeah what do you use is it uh, what's the what are the strings on there the strings these are called new tone strings i don't know if you've heard of them they're, they're actually a derbyshire strings? based company oh, are they? But yeah so they're like down the road Rock from roll derby yeah keeping it derbyshire yeah Keep, keeping it uk I mean, what um, gauge are they these are uh, 11 to 56 right. I use because I like, I don't, with a lot of tremolo mm -hmm. picking with Cradle, I don't like this string to move too mm -hmm. much. I have kind of a, it's like almost like a set of and it's like 11s a and D a set standard. of 12 or 13s. And you're just like a D standard. D standard, tuning, everything's yeah. just, mm -hmm. yes, straight standard. We use drop C as well, which is where that 56 can be very yeah. useful if I need to in the set. But in the set, we haven't used the drop C thing all that often. Yeah. So, yes. I love this. I, this is, so, this is everything that I think a guitar should be, you know, beaten up, proper. It tells stories. Yeah. yeah. Every ding tells a story. So, but let's talk about, you know, I mean, you said you've got 14 different PRSs. Yes. You, you mentioned this was your favorite one. This is obviously a sort of a full. Either, either this one or this one. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's a toss up it's between heavy, these that is, isn't it? It's really heavy. Yeah. I recently got the bridge sort because of my weird gauge of strings, this kind of hybrid set that I'm using it was just like for some reason the bridge can handle it on this one mm -hmm. but on this one it couldn't really handle so that it so had a well. wraparound bridge originally did it? this well, one had a very the... similar bridge to that right now you've got the uh, saddle as I say this adjust. is from 2000 yeah 2000 yeah. so it's uh it was everything stock apart mm. from the bridge like mm -hmm. even though I've got the wear away on this kind of yeah. saddle whatever yeah. the, the, the post I suppose you call it yeah um so that's a brand new bridge just to keep up with my gauge of uh, strings plastic on there or is it's that the kind chrome of weird thing yeah the chrome's almost come, come, come oh, it's off the chrome. But, but, I just thought you still same. like 20 years later you still haven't taken the bit of plastic off your no, pickup no no it's, 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 it's actually lifting, the chrome's coming yeah. off but again I kind of like that again this has been around the world it'll be part of the tone times. don't do it don't you, you never it. know you never know because <laughs> I, I really like these pickups I love the tone that comes from them yeah um, so there's a side of me going shall I replace that or not so i don't know but as i say this is the guitar that the only time this gets seen now is if something really drastically happens yeah. to that like if there's electronic problems or a string snap which touch wood yeah this hasn't been needed really because 
No, it's again, the strings hold up. Like with Newtone strings, I should say this as well. I was using other brand of strings. Mm -hmm. I've used everything going ever. Um, but these ones, we can do so many shows on oh, one cool. set of strings. Are they still got that they're coated bright string, thing. or just? I don't think they're coated. No, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not that. Just obviously an alloy that doesn't it comes uh, out. react to your sweat. That, that's um, the thing. We, we, like with other strings, we're changing them like every two or three shows. I'm doing like every yeah. four or five with oh, these, cool. and they just made down the road from me as well and it just which helps as well yeah, I know absolutely. all the guys and it's nice having that kind of relationship with of course as well so yeah. but yeah so this is the one like the, the pre-lawsuit PRS and there's just yeah. something about the feel of this that I really like and the tone is is brilliant that's I cool. really really like and, it and the and the 24 you've got that's an oldie isn't it that that's one? an oldie yeah that's a, a 93 which mm -hmm. I found in Saarbrücken Germany a, a shop called Music House mm -hmm. um, and this weirdly enough has, has a story to tell as well behind it um, which I'll try and keep it as short as, as I can um, basically I was on tour time to kill I'm only needed for the sound check and the show so I was mm -hmm. like right I'll just go wander around on my own see what I can find and we had this music shop and they, they got this in like the day before mm -hmm. as well as I think there's something like 12 other guitars this guy just sold all, all these hand, guitars yeah. all second mm -hmm. hand uh, there was all kinds of stuff in this guy's collection and it turns out it was the dad of a, a touring musician. Mm -hmm. He went to like MIT and mm -hmm. he managed to get a job with a, a really big German pop band at the time whose name escapes me to be honest. Um, so he went over when he was 18, went to MIT, toured the world multiple times, bought this in LA when he was there and um, not long after he bought his guitar, he was on tour, and it sounds very depressing, but he just oh. didn't wake up. It was one of those kind of things. Bummer. And it, which sounds really morbid, I know, yeah. but... Uh, but his soul reasons. lives on. But, but really enough, guitars. I bought this guitar, tried it out. My guitar tech, who notoriously doesn't like PRS guitars, weirdly enough, yeah. uh, <laughs> he's very much a Gibson Not Fender another guy. one! Damn you, Richard! <laughs> <laughs> it was like that. Um, Can't you play but, Telecasters? But, but weirdly enough... Oh, I love Telecasters, though, to be fair. <laughs> I've got a couple at home as well. So, I forgot... About, yeah, Telecasters, I forgot about Telecasters. Um, so, I... I Played this guitar and I told him about it. I went back going, oh, mm. this is a great PRS that I've just tried. Took him down. He was like, if you don't buy this, I will. And this is a guy who really doesn't like PRSs. He's just, there's something magical about yeah. it. And yeah, the, weirdly enough, I bought it and the shop owner phoned the dad of the guy. Like mm -hmm. It was like 15 years later or something. He finally went, I finally need closure. I need to get rid of these guitars. Right, right. Um, and apparently the guy just cried on the phone going, well, it's, at least it's going to have a life beyond he bought yeah. it as a touring guitar now it's going to be a touring guitar funny isn't it the, the sort of the emotional connection that's that you can make with a guitar isn't it it's, it's like, great uh, it's weird like and that's what i love about it. they're not just as any guitarist knows they're not just wooden strings yeah. it's, it's emotional investment yeah. it's hours and hours and hours gone into these things and yeah i love stories like this and that's why i love secondhand guitars so much and again mm. that's the reason why i've got as many purists as i have it's not because I'm made of money, far from it, because I've spent all my money on guitars. Um, but um, I get them either second hand or thanks to the endorsement, I get yeah. them cheaper. Um, but I like second hand guitars because they've got that story to tell. I'm always curious if there is a backstory to guitars. Mm. And that's why I actively still search for second hand instruments. Oh, that's cool, man. And, uh, it's super cool. I love it. I love it. So, from um, a extremely valuable collection of 14 Paul Reed Smith guitars that I suspect is worth something in the region of 20 or 30 thousand pound and upwards let's talk about your sort of amp setup in Cradle's <laughs> Filth or the lack of it it because this weird. is I, this is just bizarre when, when you put it like that it's like why am I playing these these quite pricey guitars through the cheapest thing I can possibly <laughs> find. And as I say, when we first started in the band, we were, I was running through a Messer and this Rooster Cab. Then when we did a tour of Russia, just for practicality reasons, like the band kind of invested in these in, in the Kempers, which mm -hmm. again, are incredible. But then when uh, our old guitar tech kind of left and he owned one of them, and the tour manager left as well to go with another band, he owned one of them. And it was like, right, now we're Kemperless. What do we do? Yeah. Uh, Got in touch with Kemper again. It was like, well, I use one tone. It was quite a lot of money for one tone. Mm -hmm. Ironically, I would use it a lot more in like the musical theatre yeah. stuff and the cover band stuff I do. Um, but I was like, I can't really justify the cost of it for one yeah. tone. And then 
weirdly enough, both me and Ashar, we were getting ready for a show at uh, Loud Park Festival in Japan. So I went to my local guitar shop. It was just like, have you got anything? It needs to be DI'd, but sounds great. Yeah. And isn't very big, because again, the logistics of touring, for a lot of people who don't know this, but just the fees you get are less and less and less. Uh, it, just for music industry being mm-hmm. not very good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's still great, but it's just, you're not commanding the fees you once were. So, but unfortunately, like, the hotel room costs go up. Yes. Airline costs yeah, yeah. go up. So it's all that kind of stuff where it's like, anything that you can fit preferably in your guitar case, get them. Like get yeah. that and a backup. Yeah. So I was just searching around and then the guitar shop, I was at um, Rattle and Drum in Derby, they were just saying, try this. Here's the Moore, um I can't remember the name. The I've changed boog- the name of it, it the now. Boogie one? It's, it's the one that's based on an EVH 5150. Oh, okay. Which I had recorded, wheel enough, with Emperor Chum with an actual EVH 5150, so I was very familiar with the tone. So just in case people aren't sure, this is the, I think they retail at £99, and it's a micro pedal, and it's a, it's a, it's a effectively like one of the channels of an EVH 5150 yep. with some cab sim, I yep. think, isn't it? And mm-hmm. it's, it's like... Yeah, it's 19, enough, it it's, has two channels because it has the clean right. ta- yeah. tone as well, just a, a, a little switch that yeah. goes from a clean to a distortion. And I was like, that sounds great. I literally played an A chord on it and just went, because it's so cheap as well, I was like, stick it in the bag, I want it. Literally one chord, I was like, that is ridiculous. We stuck it for a 2B12 cab with the uh, Baby Bomb 30 watt power amp oh, man. and I was like if, if anything this is a great backup rig which weirdly enough um, a friend of mine's guitar tech for Judas Priest their backup rig is the Moor which this is crazy great isn't? advert absolutely Moore. crazy crazy yeah, advert yeah, yeah. And, but not a lot of people know about Moor I've been having Moor pedals on my board ever since I went to the Birmingham guitar show like 10 years ago and they're like for one day only they're like half price I was like oh how much is that and they're like about 30 quid I was like what Give me five, you know, like just stock up with as many no, as possible. That's crazy. outrageous. It is absolutely crazy. And they crazy. sound great. And um, like I say, I'll use anything that gives me the tone that I need. Yeah. It's not like I'm loyal to but a million you, different things, but the Moor does what you said, I need so, it to do. So you went from Moor, but at least running into a proper guitar cab, to now the yeah. ultimate sacrilege. Of you're, you're now using the, the Moor little radar cab sim. So your yeah. entire rig to go into the PA with yeah, is are two little micro two pedals. That's it. So we've got the wireless running into the two micro How did you even get on this show? I don't know. I know. It's just like... I feel like such a bitter <laughs> disappointment to the guitar community. But I love playing for amps. There is a, there is a <coughs> place for everything. But the Moore thing and the Kemper thing, Axfx, Line 6 stuff, whatever it is, it's all to do with what you need it to do yeah. and the practicalities of it. When it got to a point where we do a lot of fly shows, a lot of yeah, fly yeah. dates, we can't afford to either rent the gear over there yeah. or bring it with us. Um, it, so it was pure practical reasons, but they sound great. Do you, do you have like a massive flight case for 14 PRS guitars that's like the size of a camper van and then like a special flight case just like this big with like three big massive latches and a combination I, lock and you open it and it goes, oh. I would love that. I think I would, that would be brilliant. I would love that. Like, I don't know if you've seen um, Barry and Rhapsody, the new film. Where, uh, the I haven't film. seen it yet. There, no. There's the op- like opening scene where they're opening up the case and there's like f- f- Freddy's like microphone and then a bottle of Jack Daniels and some well, that's, cigarettes. That's what I That's what see. I feel like I should have with the yes. Moors this huge Moore, case if you're watching this now things. send Richard for Christmas a flight case with a, with the pedals that Jack Daniels and uh, and do you smoke I don't smoke okay so we just don't need the stick cigarettes. more Moore stuff in there yeah more Jack Daniels <laughs> uh, yeah. um, but uh, that, that's the rig and like I say I do love amps and like th- this is like heaven to me just walking and seeing this kind of thing and I love amps, I love guitars, but like I say, it's whatever you need for the job. The, the Moore thing came about through sheer practicality. That's like, great. probably wouldn't record with yeah. it, but for yeah. live use, it's, it does the job. I, I think, do you know what? It's such a cool story on so many different levels. You know, the, 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 the music college, the getting the break, and you know, and, and just, I, I, get, you know, no, I guarantee you, I say I guarantee you, I, w- I guess nobody leaves a Cradle of Filth show going, I didn't really like the sound of that Moore preamp. You know, they'll just hear a they massive hear, guitar sound it's huge. and they'll love it and 
We're just very Happy lucky days, to man. play big venues with these huge PAs. Yeah. So as soon as you hook, hook it up to these big PAs, yeah. it's gonna sound big because of the sheer amount of speakers that are pushing the air of it. Oh, well, that's but, awesome. Like our sound, sound guy, he likes it direct. Like it's great for everybody in for the band sure. because it's easily controlled. But there's still a side of me that really Do you have a special misses. roadie for it as well? Like, do you have to have a special team of roadies that come in just to literally lift it up? Cat, two man, two yeah, man two lift like that. Just yeah, that. Then. <laughs> Don't drop it! <laughs> as I say, like, to be honest with you, the guitar tech position in Cradle must be really easy. They've even admitted, they're like, yeah, like they've teched for all kinds of people. And they're, they're going, yeah, I just have to plug in two pedals for each guy. Ah, uh, it's lucky uh, days, so, man. Yeah. All right, well, look. It's been an awesome to hear hear all the stories and everything like that. I, you know, fantastic to listen after thirty odd years to my first bit of Cradle of Filth as well. Um, good luck with everything. I hope the Cradle tour lasts for as long as you want it to, and you're never out of work at Christmas. And whatever your local pantomime is. Oh yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love like that's always just been the dream for me. Just play guitar for a oh, living, and I do a million different things. Like I say, even if. I wasn't in Cradle, I'd still be doing the whole Good teaching you, thing, panto thing, and <laughs> like I do between tours. I'm just there just for anybody. Life. I just, I, I'm a very, very lucky guy. I play guitar for a living, and it's not lost on me. That that's what it is. Good for you, man. Living so, the dream. Well, look, thank you guys for watching. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, stay tuned for more stuff on Anderton's TV. And uh, yes, I'll see you later. Bye.